Is that a great new Pepsi can or what? It's Dan! Dan, my man! You're right. I really like you. Yes! <laughs> Dream phone. 1992. As a kid in the 90s, sometimes you just had to take a blind shot at whatever game it was you wanted to rent for the weekend, no matter how poorly it was named. Take, for example, one of the games released this week, Spanky's Quest, for the Super Nintendo and the Game Boy in 1992. Spanky's Quest is a game by Natsume where you play as a monkey named Spanky. Fun fact, this game was released before innuendos were invented. Of course, the advertisements for the game also claim that it's fun for the whole family. Fun for the whole family. Moving right along. As Spanky, you must climb the evil witch Morticia's tower to save the forest. You jump around, defeat enemies, and collect keys to escape. While it may be a platformer at its core, Spanky's quest is more of a puzzle platformer. The only attack you have is making a ball and bouncing it off of Spanky's head to make it bigger. Then the ball can explode into various sports balls to defeat enemies. The puzzle comes from finding where to stand and how to get the balls bounced to pop and get them all. Instead of just trying to get to the end of the level, it's more of a clear the screen type of game. Besides that, Sometimes you get different hats? I don't know. This game is weird, man. Are you hearing the words that I'm saying? You play as a monkey named Spanky, bouncing balls to kill fruit enemies. As I mentioned, this was also released on the Game Boy at the same time. Aside from the obvious graphical stuff, it's pretty much the same game, with one major exception. There are no keys. You just kill all the enemies. And Spanky looks less like a monkey and more like a naked fat kid with a long tail. Hey, Editor Dylan here. I don't normally do this, but I was recording the footage for Hanky Spanky Boy, and I just had to mention this music. Is that the theme song for Baby Bottle Pop? You know, Baby Bottle Pop? Do I really need to edit that into the commercial for Baby Bottle Pop? At release, Spanky's Quest got reviews that were very mid. EGM considered it good, but not exceptional. That issue of EGM was also from earlier in the year, where it listed Spanky's Quest to have a spring release. But for whatever reason, it wouldn't come out until July. As of today, Spanky's Quest is an incredibly forgotten game. One of those games where you can see it, but not a single detail of it is retained in your memory. As forgetful as it is, you can play it right now using the SNES Online Library for the Nintendo Switch. While that game may not have stayed in everyone's mind, this next game definitely did. Also released this week for the Sega Genesis was Splatterhouse 2. 1992 was the year of violent video games. The ESRB would be created later this year because of games like Mortal Kombat, Lethal Enforcers, and of course, Night Trap. But they seem to have completely overlooked Splatterhouse. So, you want to know the story of Splatterhouse, the new horror video game for TurboGrafx-16? They say he stalks the old haunted mansion. They say he's looking for his girlfriend. They say his only weapon against the maggot-eating ghouls who took her is a two-by-four. And you say you want to play this game? Splatterhouse. Only for the TurboGrafx-16 system from NEC. The original was an incredibly violent arcade game in 1988, and it was only ever ported to the TurboGrafx-16. The sequel, Splatterhouse 2, is only for the Sega Genesis. It plays largely the same as the original. You play as Rick, a guy taken over by the sentient terror mask, making him super buff and not at all a reference to any kind of famous movie teenager killer. It's essentially a beat-em-up as you move to the end of the stage, punching and kicking every enemy in the way and taking down bosses. But also like the original, you can pick up weapons like pipes and 2x4s to slap enemies into the background into a splattery blow. Bloody mess. In fact, there is an extraordinary amount of gore. Enemies will explode out into bloody, oozy messes. There's lots of honestly pretty scary things against certain bosses. Compare this to other games coming out around the same time, like Spanky's Quest. This was some seriously hardcore stuff. All that said, the gameplay is surprisingly basic. You can only move left or right. There are no horizontal planes where you have to line yourself up to attack enemies. And a lot of the bosses have easily readable patterns. In fact, 
the blood and the gore was essentially the main selling point, because without that, it isn't too much better than something like Altered Beast. Splatterhouse 2 was the featured game for the May 1992 issue of GamePro Magazine. It was half a review and half an advertisement about how cool, how bloody, and how gooey it was. I really gotta highlight the last paragraph, where it says, If you've ever wanted to seek revenge on all those early childhood monsters in the closet, now's your chance to do it vicariously through Splatterhouse 2. Of course, it got glowing reviews from GamePro, but video games and computer entertainment thought differently. They gave it very average scores, noting that it was too similar to the original and did nothing to advance the genre. Splatterhouse 2 did get a re-release onto the Wii's virtual console in 2008 where, with the ESRB now existing, it would be the only mature rated game to ever be on the Wii Virtual Console. Splatterhouse 3 would come out for the Sega Genesis next year, and then the series would lay dormant, all the way until 2010, with the reboot simply titled Splatterhouse for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. In that, one of the secret unlockables you can get was Splatterhouse 2. You may be familiar with the subgenre of modern mobile games called runner games. Games like Temple Run or Sonic Dash. One of the first ever runner games got ported to the Sega Genesis this week in 1992, Atomic Runner. You know those levels in Mario games where the stage is always scrolling and you have to keep up? Atomic Runner basically took that idea and made it the whole game. The stage is always moving, meaning you must constantly move around to avoid bottomless pits and to shoot down enemies in the way and collecting weapon power-ups. The endless scrolling does end when you reach the stages and boss. Atomic Runner is actually a port of an arcade game titled Atomic Runner Chelnov in 1988. A few things were changed for the Genesis version. For example, the story originally was a guy trapped in a coal mine was trying to escape a nuclear explosion was changed to a guy in a spacesuit was trying to save his sister from the evil Deathtarians. But also, the graphics are a step up from the arcade version. I especially gotta point out some of the backgrounds, specifically the final boss area where you have to fight it on top of the Statue of Liberty. It's not exactly the most in-depth game, as it is a port of an arcade game. Still, people liked it. Gaming magazine Sega Visions gave it fairly positive review scores, and the first ever issue of Electronic Games called it a generally brainless shooter, but what more could you want from a side shooter, giving it a score of a 75%. The Sega Genesis version is the only one of Atomic Runner the West would ever see. It was ported onto the Wii's Virtual Console in Japan, but never here. However, there was going to be a Sega Saturn version. That version was shown off the Tokyo Game Show in 1997, and even had demos on display in various Akihabara stores, but that version never came out. However, in 2012, a fully playable prototype of the Sega Saturn version of Atomic Runner was uploaded to the internet. It's basically the same game, but it's for the Sega Saturn, so that's cool. As of today, the Atomic Runner never got new games or ports or anything for modern consoles. The Runner isn't completely forgotten, though. In the 2020 release of Windjammers 2, go to the ring stage, look in the upper left, and there you will see in the crowd, cheering his little atomic heart out, is the Atomic Runner. She ate him. Thanks to Mario, anything and everything needed to have some kind of platformer game for success and for the kids. Now, many games ripped him off, but there were some other platformer games that were clear inspirations. Take this title, The Viking Child, released for the Game Boy this week in 1992. Its full title, Prophecy 1, The Viking Child, is a platformer originally released for DOS and ported over to Game Boy and the Atari Lynx. In it, you play as the Viking Child, jumping through a cartoony world, using a pathetic stab attack, and trying to get to the end of the stage. However, unlike most other platformers, you can move left and right and earn money to spend in shops for various upgrades. Of course, the game isn't even a fraction as good looking as its box art. They definitely made it all about the Viking Child for the DOS and Atari Lynx versions, but the Game Boy version, they clearly leaned into the prophecy part of the title. This tells me nothing though. I would think this is like another Shadowgate kind of game or something. Like I said, a lot of companies were fine with ripping off Mario and calling it a day. They didn't do that here. Instead, the Viking Child is derivative of another youthful platformer game, 
Wonder Boy in Monsterland for the Sega Master System. If the attack animation and platforming didn't make it clear enough for you, the shops definitely do. How this didn't lead to a lawsuit, I'm not really sure. Probably because nobody cares about the Viking child. And that's not just me saying that. Nintendo Power reviewed the Game Boy version of the game with an average score of a 2.7 out of 5 from Nintendo trying to sell games for their own hardware. As was implied by the extended title, there was to be a Prophecy 2, but that's never seen the light of day. You can play Prophecy 1, The Viking Child, right now because somebody made it available to play on Steam. However, as of this video, it currently has four reviews so I wouldn't bet on that sequel anytime soon. One of my favorite things about doing this show is being able to learn and talk about all kinds of underappreciated games on underappreciated consoles. Take this game. Released this week in 1992 is Lords of the Rising Sun for the TurboGrafx CD. Originally released a few years earlier for home computers, Lords of the Rising Sun is a strategy action game. It has three playable characters with their own stories. Most of it is typical turn-based strategy stuff with moving units and checking territories and all that. However, the game turns to something else when battle occurs. From here, you'll send your units at each other and sometimes you ride on a horse yourself, cutting down enemies before you. And then when you attack castles, you play in a top-down, almost Zelda-like game to take it over within a time Time limit. But when your castle gets invaded, you swap to a first-person archery defense minigame. There's, there's a lot going on here. Most of it plays pretty poorly. I will applaud it for having a lot of variety for a strategy game, and I'm not alone in that. GamePro reviewed Lords of the Rising Sun in issue 38, noting its frustrating control, but apparently incredible sound design. The legacy of this game can still be seen today. One year later, it was ported over to the CDI, and popular strategy series Total War has outright stated one of their biggest inspirations was Lords of the Rising Sun. And now for something that might be a little painful. A racing series from Nintendo that hasn't seen a new iteration since the early 2000s. Yeah, I'm talking about Wave Race. Wave Race started for the Game Boy, where you race around on jet skis. It's seen from the top-down view as you go against three other racers, riding around the track while passing smiley face buoys to make sure you aren't cutting across the water. There's even obstacles like jumps and mini whirlpools and power-ups you can grab, like a slower, dumber Mario Kart. And that's pretty much it. The gameplay is slow, and you can finish an entire Grand Prix in less than 10 minutes. There's also limited sound effects and no music during the races, so it's not an exciting experience by any means. However, Wave Race had a major selling point. It was one of only 10 games released in the West that could use the Game Boy multiplayer link cable for four player multiplayer. Wave Race went on to sell over a million copies and even got a Player's Choice re-release. And I'm assuming most people got it because they really wanted to try that four-player Game Boy thing. Wave Race would, of course, go on to have two sequels. Wave Race 64 was released for the Nintendo 64 in 1996, and Wave Race Blue Storm was released for the Nintendo GameCube in 2001. And since then, the most we've seen of Wave Race is some of the 64 racers showing up as spirits in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Wave Race producer Shinya Takahashi teased that there could be a new Wave Race game in 2018, possibly for the Nintendo Switch. Now since then, not a single word, and it's been four years, so let's be real, nothing's gonna happen. Build your punching power before your energy runs out. There are video games and then there are cultural milestones and sometimes those cultural milestones make it to home console. Released July 15th, 1992 for the Super Nintendo was Street Fighter 2. 
Stay calm. Concentrate on the screen. Street Fighter 2 is on Super Nintendo. From the arcades, the ultimate combat game. Each fighter has a different technique, an acrobatic move, a hidden punch. It's on the streets now, exclusively on Super Nintendo. Super Nintendo with Street Fighter 2. It's unbeatable. It is impossible to overstate how important Street Fighter 2 was when it reached arcades in February 1991. It pioneered the very concept of the 1v1 fighting game with multiple playable characters of different moves and abilities with a proper two-player versus mode, the mere concept of combos. It basically revived the arcade scene to beyond the height of its popularity of the early 80s. Arcade owners had to keep buying more and more Street Fighter 2 cabinets. For well over a year, it was said it was impossible to bring to home comp because it was such a massive, impressive game. So you can imagine the absolute hype when Capcom announced a port of Street Fighter 2 for the Super Nintendo. Street Fighter 2 for the SNES was beyond impressive as it not only looked like it, it played like it and sounded like it too. This was no small feat and Street Fighter 2 was the first ever 16 megabit ROM cartridge ever produced just to make it all fit in there. Of course, a few things were changed for the home console. Most importantly, a mistranslation. Everyone remembers Ryu's infamous win quote of, you must defeat Shen Long to stand a chance, where it was supposed to say, sure you can. In the SNES game and in the instruction manual itself, it was fixed to say, you must defeat my Dragon Punch to stand a chance. The Electronic Gaming Monthly 1992 April Fools was so widespread and well known that it directly inspired the appearance of Goken, Ken and Ryu's master in Street Fighter 4. Speaking of appearances, the SNES box art is also notable. For one, it was done by artist Mark McGinty. He's also done the box art for games like Streets of Rage 2, Kid Chameleon, and like a billion Zoo Tycoon games. Now in the 90s, this isn't just great box art, this is one of the few instances where the characters on the box actually resemble how they appear in the game. May seem silly to say, but this made more people purchase Street Fighter 2 for the SNES because they had a much better idea of exactly what it was they were getting. Naturally, Street Fighter 2 went on to sell gangbusters. It's gotten so many updates, ports, and re-releases. You say you want to be a Street Fighter. You're no Street Fighter. Not until you master the six world warriors of the Street Fighter 2 handheld game. Hundred hand slaps and rolling attacks, fireballs and hurricane kicks are your weapons. Beat three in a row. Zangi, Honda, Blanca, then we'll talk. Street Fighter 2 handheld game, doomed from Tiger, batteries not included. It also spawned a wave of clones, wannabes, and true competitors. It's basically thanks to Street Fighter 2 that the competitive fighting game community even exists, leading to massive tournaments like EVO. It sold millions of units on the Super Nintendo. In the top 10 best-selling Super Nintendo games of all time, Street Fighter 2 ranks number five and is the best-selling third-party game for the system. I myself have a lot of fond memories of Street Fighter 2. Anytime my family went to our local Pizza Hut, I'd waste a bunch of quarters on the Raiden arcade cabinet, and then I found myself enamored with the one next to it, Street Fighter 2. Even if I was awful at it, I still rented Street Fighter 2 because I could take that Pizza Hut arcade game home. At the time, I played a lot of Dalsum because I thought the stretchy arms and legs were cool, and I couldn't even do a proper Hadouken, which at the time, I thought they were saying, Ryuken, because it was used by Ryu and Ken. Give me a break, man. I don't know. Kid logic. And now back to our regular schedule of obscure games I knew nothing about until we started doing research about it, like this one, Night Quest, released this week for the Game Boy in 1992. It's one of the better looking Game Boy games with large distinct sprites and clear animations. Gameplay has you moving around the overworld, talking to town folks and buying things, and battles move to a 2D side view. It's an RPG, so you can use attacks and magic, but you have four different physical attacks to choose from. There's no difference between them other than each monster is weak to one of these attacks. Figure out which it is, and you can basically one-shot every single enemy you come across. Aside from the pretty cool attack animations, everything else about Night Quest is super basic. The story is as generic as it comes, it's super short at like four hours for an RPG, and not a whole lot of replay value. You go around, you kill stuff, 
you level up and buy stuff so you can go kill bigger stuff. It's basically Dragon Quest 1, but shorter and with fancier attack graphics. Even the developers knew the game was short and shallow. To help stretch out game time, the instruction manual itself tells you, just go outside and grind for a bit. Just go kill some stuff. Go ahead, go out there. Waste some hours. In 2019, an all new A Knight's Quest was released on all major platforms. Although that has nothing to do with the Game Boy original, even though they share the exact same name. And that is the last we ever heard of Night Quest for the Game Boy. One of my weird childhood rentals for the NES back in the day was the fishing game, The Black Bass. This week in 1992, it got a sequel titled the Blue Marlin. The second game in the Black Bass franchise, the Blue Marlin, is a fishing simulator. You pick a fishing destination, drive your boat out, and then reel them in. And compared to the first game, the gameplay is a drastic improvement. Now you can drive the boat to actively troll for fish, and when one bites, it switches to the reeling in mini game, where you pull it in and use the D-pad to control the line and make your guy hilariously swivel on his chair. It also has some unique mechanics, especially for a fishing game, in that you have stats that improve as you play. You can essentially level up in strength stamina, and whatever skill does. There's even cutscene decisions where you could lose your fish. For a fishing game, it's surprisingly in-depth, especially if you compare it to the bare-bones gameplay of the original Black Bass. Fishing games are niche, but as someone who played a lot of Black Bass, I had no idea just how much better Blue Marlin is. And I'm not alone in that. Electronic Gaming Monthly reviewed it and noted that it isn't filled with intense action, but it is a surprisingly accurate fishing simulator. And I'm with them on that. I like it. The Blue Marlin would see a sequel over on the SNES with Super Black Bass and a Game Boy version, and then had many spin-offs towards the end of the 90s, with Super Black Bass Real Fight for the Game Boy Color, and then got a remake of sorts for the PlayStation 1, with the release of Black Bass slash Blue Marlin Combo Pack. The series would continue on into 2011 with Super Black Bass 3D, for the Nintendo 3DS. And the last we saw of it, when Retrobit released their Retrobit Generations Retro Home Console, included on there was the Blue Marlin. They're squirmy and wormy and purple and green, the grossest little creatures that you've ever seen. Gross out your sister, embarrass your dad. You can be a little creep without being bad. Creepy Crawlers Workshop with Plasti Goof. We've already had an NES D&D game come out this year, so how about another one? Released this week in 1992 is Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Dragon Strike for the NES. Unlike the other D&D games, this one puts the emphasis on dragons because you play as them. Upon the start, you can choose from one of three different metallic dragons, bronze, silver, or gold, each with their own stats. Gameplay is a top-down shooter where you fly your dragon and using its two different breath attacks to take out enemies. Unlike typical top-down shooters though, this isn't a shoot-em-up in which the screen is always vertically scrolling. Instead, you have an open map that you and your dragon explore for targets to destroy. Your dragon is also always flying forward so you can only turn it to do flyby attacks instead of staying still to shoot. Another big thing is being able to fly high or low to be able to take on different targets. Most of the things are on the ground so you'll usually end up flying low which means for the most part you'll be staring at this tiny adorable dragon. It's not very good. Reviewers at the time weren't too keen on it either. Electronic Gaming Monthly didn't like it that much. The highest score one reviewer even gave it was a 6 out of 10. Dragon Strike was developed by Westwood Studios and published by Strategic Simulations Inc., the same developer-publisher combo behind the beloved gold box SSI Dungeons & Dragons games, such as Pool of Radiance and Champions of Kryn. SSI had already released a game called Dragon Strike in 1990 for the Amiga, but that was a completely different game, in that you play as a knight riding on the back of a dragon in first-person view, jousting other dragon knights. This game also happens to share the name of a Dungeons & Dragons board game called... Dragon Strike, only this has no dragons in it, but it does have a VHS of live actors goofing around on a green screen to help explain to you the rules of the board game. I've already done a video on this. You should go watch it. Speaking of shoot 'em ups, the Neo Geo also got one released this week with Andro Dunos. Andro Dunos is another horizontal shooter like Gradius or R Type. Fly around and dodge bullets and blast everything that moves while getting power ups. Unlike most of the others, Andro Dunos allows you to switch between four different weapon sets on the fly and you can charge the attacks. It also has a two player mode and the ability to save your game if you have a memory card for your Neo Geo AES. It isn't terribly innovative. 
Kind of hard to talk about when the game is so straightforward. And while Andro Dunos itself may not be that fascinating, its legacy is. Andro Dunos was made by Visco and publisher SNK for Neo Geo Arcade and home consoles in July of 1992. It never got a port or a re-release or anything like that until 2012. In 2012, independent developer NCI ported Andro Dunos to the Neo Geo CD when they acquired the property rights of the original developer, Visco. This Neo Geo CD version is officially endorsed and then they were able to port Andro Dunos again, this time to the Sega Dreamcast in September 2021. Because why the hell not? And then there was a sequel made. Andro Dunos 2 was published by Pixel Heart in March of 2022 and can be downloaded on Steam, Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One. It was also put onto the Dreamcast and it was also put onto the Nintendo 3DS, which as far as I can tell, based on my research, this is the final commercial retail 3DS game to ever be made. It's hard to remember, but summer used to be a big drought for new game releases up until like 2008 or so. So sometimes you just had to take whatever you could get. Case in point with this week's last game, Jeep Jamboree Off-Road Adventure for the Nintendo Game Boy. Jeep Jamboree is a racing game, only it's oops all Jeeps. Whereas most racing games on Game Boy were either top down or side view, Jeep Jamboree is in first person. This means a wheel in front of you, a small mini map, and playing at about five frames per second. To be fair, it has some things going for it. It was one of the first racing games that allowed you to go off road and have your car be affected by the rough terrain. I say rough terrain, but really it's a sea of gray. It may look okay here, but now imagine trying to play this game on a tiny Game Boy screen that wasn't even lit up and you can see where some of the issues start to arise. It did have two player link cable support so you could play it with a friend or an enemy. It's worth noting that the music was done by famed music composer Tommy Tallarico whose other works include Earthworm Jim, the video game's live concert tour, and Color a Dinosaur. Jeep Jamboree is barely an average game. Despite this, it initially received praise from GamePro Magazine, saying that it would satisfy the handheld Roadster crowd. They're wrong though. Jeep Jamboree got a Game Boy re-release in Race Days, where it was combined into a two-in-one cartridge with a previously Japanese-only racing game called Dirty Racing. When that was released in 1994, reviewers finally caught on that they both kind of suck. Upon re-review, GamePro said they both have drab graphics, boring tracks, and annoying sounds. They even harshly stated that it'll disappoint even the most liberal, I'll play anything gamer. Better late than never, I guess. Your foes are out to stop you with thundering fireballs. Oh, and collapsing bridges. Oh, whoa! Got it! Oh, and you don't win till you're off Fireball Island, the three-dimensional adventure from Milton Bradley. Pinball was a big thing in the 80s, and going into the 90s, it started to slow a bit as less and less people wanted to go out and actually play it, which is why more and more pinball video games were made, like this week's first release, Dragon's Fury for the Sega Genesis, this week in 1992. Dragon's Fury is a pinball game that isn't based on a physical pinball table, meaning they could do whatever they want with it and go buck wild. And that they did. They leaned hard into the metal part of the game as it's filled with imagery of devils, demons, dragons, and skulls. Unlike most other pinball games or tables, Dragon's Fury is filled with enemies that spawn to one, get in your way, and two, to be additional targets to rack up some points. There are also a few bonus stages that you can get into that give boss fights of sorts. A very small portion of you may actually recognize this game from a different place under a different name because Dragon's Fury on the Genesis is actually a port of Devil's Crush on the TurboGrafx-16. Naturally, a lot of changes were made to the Genesis version, besides the name change. It actually got some graphical improvements like more frames of animation and more information on a sidebar. However, it also got censored compared to the original. Any and all pentagrams were changed to stars probably because they were too satanic. Which makes less sense when you look at the backgrounds of the bonus levels. Some of these are pretty extreme. Or in the case of the Hydra Fight bonus level, the Genesis one is just more visually busy to show off than Sega graphics. Gameplay wise, it's pinball all right. Kind of disappointing is that there is only one table for you to play on. 
Still, it did get positive reviews. Mega Play Magazine generally liked it, although I do want to point out that one reviewer who didn't care for the demonic imagery and called out that it's just a port of Devil's Crush. Dragon's Fury, or Devil's Crush, whichever you prefer at this point, is actually the second title in this series of pinball games, all called Blank Crush. The first one was Alien Crush in 1988 for the TurboGrafx-16, and the third is Jockey Crush for the Super Famicom in Japan. Also, the third one is Dragon's Revenge for the Sega Genesis, but Dragon's Revenge was made by a developer who had nothing to do with Devil's Crush or the Dragon's Fury port. It's like a split in the timeline. Anyway, there was one more game in the series, Alien Crush Returns as a Nintendo WiiWare title. Not a virtual console game, a WiiWare title, and that one even had motion controls. The NES also got an all-new game this week in 1992, and it was called Defenders of Dynatron City. Defenders of Dynatron City is a beat-em-up game of sorts about superheroes, all with bizarre powers, such as Jet Headstrong, who can fire his rocket head, Buzzsaw Girl, the Atomic Radium Dog, Miss Megawatt with lightning powers, and Monkey Kid, who is a monkey kid. After choosing one of the five, you then go through the streets of Dynatron City, defeating evil robots, and can explore the interior of buildings and navigating a surprisingly big city map. It's more like a scavenger hunt of figuring out how to progress. It was developed by LucasArts, who at the time was most known for their adventure games, such as Monkey Island and Indiana Jones. But Defenders of Dynatron City wasn't just a weird game for them, oh no, it was a multimedia initiative. Premiered on February 22nd, 1992, Defenders of Dynatron City, the cartoon, was given a pilot episode on Fox Kids from Deke Animation. In this city, people love nuclear energy so much, they literally drink it because it's normal here to mutate yourself left and right. And they really tried with it too, getting star power with Whoopi Goldberg as the voice of Miss Megawatt and Tim Curry as the voice of the evil Adam Ed, the floating head, and Christopher Walken was to be in the show, but had all his recorded lines replaced, no one's sure why, and it only ever got one episode. At the same time as that, Defenders of Dinotron City, the comic book, was being released. This one was made by Marvel and lasted six issues, lasting just long enough for the launch of the video game. None of them succeeded. Nobody watched the cartoon, Fox didn't want to pay for it, nobody read the Marvel comics, and the video game sucked. It plays like ass with slippery movement on everyone and awful hit detection. It's also one of those NES games that what we call is Nintendo hard. Reviews at the time were a bit kinder than I am. GamePro and Games and Computer Entertainment magazines both praised it for its novel idea of some original superheroes, but that the game didn't really do anything special. And I can't think of anyone who actually had this game as a kid, let alone played it. I guess we just weren't enticed enough by Tim Curry back then. Speaking of Tim Curry, how about something he was actually in? Also released this week in 1992 was Clue for the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis. There's been a murder! Always dead he is. It's a classic game of Clue. Who done it, where they done it, and with which weapon they uh, done it with? I say it was in the kitchen with the wrench by Miss Scarlet. <gasps> it's dead in the library, you old geezer, with a bloody lead pipe. Nice, nice. Oh, right. Nice, in his back. The killer is Mr. Green. <laughs> Well, it could have been someone else. Oh, I'd say that's a game of Clue. First introduced over 70 years ago, Clue is one of the most popular board games of all time. And Clue, the video game, is just that, a recreation of Clue. Or if you live outside of the US, Cluedo. If you're unfamiliar with Clue, a body was discovered in a big old mansion, and you must use the clues you have to determine who the killer was, what the weapon used was, and where. Now I'll give the game credit, as they did try to spice it up with some nifty animations. There are well animated intro sequences and of the different characters using the different weapons. There's also a hand that comes up to roll the dice. This same hand animation would also be used for Monopoly, also on the SNES and the Sega Genesis. There really isn't much else to say about Clue. I guess if you really want to play the board game, you can just play with computer opponents because playing with other human players would make no sense because you can see everyone else's cards allowing anyone to immediately determine the winning result and just race to the finish. They didn't really think that part through. There's also like no music while you play, except for when making accusations, and the only real sound effect is dice rolling and moving. It's the whole game of Clue, only much more lonely than, say, 
playing a video game version of Clue by yourself with computer players. There were game magazine reviews of Clue at the time as well, but there's no point in going over them because I can tell you what they all said. It sure is Clue, but on your console, yay! A seemingly unassuming small project for a small console featuring a small guy would grow to be our gargantuan success. Released on August 1st, 1992, was Kirby's Dream Land for the Nintendo Game Boy. Most people know Kirby now for being an adorable round pink guy who has a penchant for consuming enemies like the eldritch horror he truly is. He could then steal their powers to use as his own to battle through stages. However, in his debut game, Kirby's Dream Land, Kirby didn't do that. There were no powers to steal, and he wasn't even pink. Gameplay of Kirby's Dream Land is still familiar to anyone who's ever played any other Kirby game after this one. Grow through many levels, sucking in enemies and spitting them back out to defeat others. He could still fly around as much as he wanted to make any kind of platforming a spring breeze. Kirby's Dream Land was the very first game worked on by Masahiro Sakurai at only age 19. His idea was to make a very simple, very easy platformer for the Game Boy as it was meant to be a sort of gateway game for a younger audience to explore other harder platform style games, which is why the gameplay is so basic and Kirby can literally fly over everything. Kirby wasn't even supposed to be the main character. He was a placeholder sprite that they ended up loving anyways. During development, Kirby was originally named Twinkle Popo and development studio HAL Laboratories was going to publish it themselves. However, when interest in their title was low, they asked if Nintendo would publish it. Nintendo said, okay, but we're gonna make some changes. One, his name isn't Twinkle Popo. In order to help his international appeal, they asked Nintendo of America what a good American sounding name would be for the cute little guy. They said, Kirby. Now, legend has it, the reason Nintendo of America gave this name was that they just settled a lawsuit with Universal Studios over the rights of the name Donkey Kong. Nintendo won that lawsuit and their lawyer's name was John Kirby, which is where they got the name, allegedly. Kirby's release in the West caused a lot of confusion over his color. Masahiro Sakurai has stated that he always saw Kirby as pink. Japanese advertisements for Kirby's Dream Land even had him as pink. But for Nintendo of America, they only had the Game Boy game to work off of, and that didn't display any colors, so naturally, they thought he was grayscale. Recently, we compared two superheroes, Dashing Super Guy and Kirby from Nintendo. In some ways, Kirby lost big. No big hair, no big muscles, no weapons, nothing. All Kirby's got is appetite. Kirby's Dream Land, the thrilling new adventure game on Game Boy. Kirby munches, spits back, and floats, saving glorious Dreamland. He's Kirby, and he packs a mean bite. Kirby's Dream Land, only on Game Boy. By the time they realized their mistake, it was too late. The box art advertising and US television commercial all have a black and white Kirby. Don't worry though, they would fix this with Kirby's very next game, Kirby's Adventure for the NES, less than a year later. Kirby's Dream Land went on to sell millions for the Game Boy. The aforementioned NES sequel then cemented Kirby's ability to gain powers. He would go on to have numerous sequels, including Kirby's Dream Land 2 on the Game Boy in 1995, Kirby's Dream Land 3 for the Super NES in 1997, Kirby Superstar, Kirby's Dream Course, Kirby Star Stacker, Kirby Tilt and Tumble, Kirby Air Ride. There's like dozens more, with the most recent being Kirby and the Forgotten Land for Nintendo Switch in 2022, with another Kirby game already on the way. As for how Kirby's Dream Land holds up today, I don't like it. It's really hard to go back to and not have Kirby's signature abilities to steal. In fact, as a kid, I played Kirby's Adventure first and then this one, and I was confused why nothing was working when I was swallowing enemies for sword or cutter. It also really is way too easy, but that's exactly what they were going for. If that wasn't a big enough release for you, also released on the very same day of August 1st, 1992, was Mario Paint for the SNES. It was quiet, except for the cows. Then a rock fell from the sky, so I sat on it. 
that it was really a spaceship. Then these aliens surrounded me, and I could actually read their minds. Should we fry it or boil it? Whoa! So I pushed a button and made it disintegrate. Okay, so I made it up. Then I made it all happen. Mario Paint. Draw and make music. Only on the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Mario Paint was one of the first home console creative art video games where the goal isn't to beat any kind of level, but rather to grab some virtual brushes and let your imagination fly. It was Kid Picks for the Super Nintendo. Mario Paint could only be played with an all new accessory bundled in with every copy of the game, the SNES mouse, allowing for precision and more natural painting movements. In addition to making images or coloring pre-made ones, you could also make primitive animations, compose your own music, or take a break with the Nat Attack minigame. Mario Paint was a move by Nintendo that can only be described as ingenious. It showed parents that video games could be more than just brain noise, it could also be a creative outlet inspiring young minds. It also got people to have the SNES mouse, allowing for future games to take advantage of it. Even with a premium prize point bundle, it sold over 2 million copies. Its legacy is still seen to this day in a variety of forms. The music composer spawned an entire subgenre of sorts on the internet, with many people making original songs or more famously, hundreds of covers of well-known songs using the Mario Paint Music Composer online. Decades long running web animation series Homestar Runner, home of the Strong Bad Emails cartoons, had its very first episode created using the animation tools in Mario Paint. Super Mario Maker and Super Mario Maker 2 would also borrow elements from Mario Paint, namely the Undo Dog, the Core Spot, and the Inclusion of the Nat Attack minigame. As far as official sequels go, there was only ever Mario Artist for the ill-fated Nintendo 64 disk drive, the Japan-only CD-ROM attachment. And it wasn't just one Mario Artist game, it was three. Mario Artist Paint Studio, Mario Artist Polygon Studio, and Mario Artist Talent Studio. There were even four more Mario Artist entries planned but those were canceled with the failure of the 64DD. As far as the SNES Mario Paint goes, I still love it. Admittedly, as a kid, I did play the Nat Attack minigame a lot, and I was too young to know how to make any kind of music, but I would spend entire afternoons just creating my own masterpieces. And then seeing all the fun ways to obliterate them all with the numerous delete all buttons. If you've been keeping track, you know that there's already been two Dungeons & Dragons video games released this year. And now, we have the third. Dungeons & Dragons Warriors of the Eternal Sun, released for the Sega Genesis on July 31st, 1992. This D&D game mixes overhead exploration and first-person dungeon crawling. Like most other D&D games of the time, you can create your entire party from scratch, choosing from a handful of playable classes and races. When you see enemies on the overworld, battle switches to a turn-based strategy, very similar to previous D&D games like Pool of Radiance. However, if you're in a dungeon, combat plays out in real time, playing more akin to the Eye of the Beholder series of games. Between all of this is your typical D&D fair, getting new equipment, leveling up, and saving the land from the big bad evil guy. All of this while playing to some surprisingly jamming music. It still uses the AD&D 2.0 rule set, which means classes level up at different speeds, magic spells are rare, and if you don't already know what Thacko is, read a wiki article explaining it. Warriors of the Eternal Sun was developed by Westwood Associates, who would later become part of Westwood Studios, meaning this development team was not part of the SSI Gold Box games like Pool of Radiance, but they were the developers to the previous D&D game on this show, Dragon Strike on the NES, and they would eventually be known for creating a franchise called Command and Conquer. Fun fact, Warriors of the Eternal Sun takes place in the D&D setting of Mistara, placing it alongside only a handful of other D&D video games in that setting, namely Order of the Griffin for the TurboGrafx-16 and Dungeons and Dragons, Tower of Doom and Shadows over Mistara, the iconic 
beat-em-ups from Capcom. Reviews at the time were self-admittedly biased. Electronic Gaming Magazine gave it some sevens, but also had two scores of four, with those reviewers basically saying they don't like RPGs. As for what I think of it, it's a pretty well done D&D game. The overhead movement reminded me of the later Ultima games, and I still like first person dungeon crawling, but be forewarned, this game is hard as balls. I spent like 50 minutes making my entire party, perfecting them to be as best as possible, and I then walked outside the castle walls and watched every single one of them get absolutely obliterated by five snakes. And they weren't even sticks before that. Remember that time in the 80s where a lot of incredibly violent action movies that were all rated R ended up being a huge hit with actual children? Case in point with this week's first game, Robocop 3 for the NES in 1992. Robocop 3 for the NES is a simple side-scrolling action game controlling Robocop equipped with a small selection of different weapons to use, all while jumping, running, and gunning. Well, I say running, but it's Robocop, so it's more like an aggressive power walk. Between levels, you enter the repair laboratory, allowing you to spend the power-ups you collected throughout the level to repair and power up Robocop and his different parts. I honestly could not tell you what changes or improves with each repair, though. The game is pretty short, with only five levels. However, However, you do fight ninjas at the end, and you get to use Robocop's gyrocycle from the movie. And the movie is the interesting part. The Robocop 3 video game is releasing in August of 1992. Robocop 3, the movie, would not release until November of 1993. This made making a game adaptation difficult. Development of the video games started in 1990, the same year that the movie Robocop 2 was just successful enough. But the developers basically knew zero details about the third movie. Thankfully, the movie studio did send them some production stills and trickled out small bits of information. With that, the game developers had to make do with a lot of guesswork. For example, when they heard about Robocop having a gyro cycle, they immediately got to work on making levels with Robocop on a sweet ass motorcycle, only to find out that the gyro cycle was a jetpack. As one developer, Martin Kenwright explained, weeks of work were just wasted. There were more errors besides that. For example, if you go to the NES game's title screen, if you look closely, you can see a literal baby girl holding a 9mm Uzi ready to dish out some justice. I don't remember that part of the movie. Now, if you think it's bizarre for the incredibly violent Robocop to get a video game for a predominantly kid-focused video game system, keep in mind, Robocop was a massive hit with the kids. Also keep in mind, Robocop shot a dude in the dick. In fact, Robocop was so popular with kids in America that he got his own Saturday morning cartoon show in Robocop 3, the video game, was made to hype up kids and drag the parents along to go see the movie in theaters. Again, an entire year later, the SNES game comes out in September of 1992, and the Genesis version comes out in early 1993, and the computer versions already came out in late 1991. And it didn't help, the movie sucked. The NES got more games this week in 1992, with might and Magic, Secret of the Inner Sanctum. Might and Magic is a long-running RPG series beginning in 1986. Secret of the Inner Sanctum is the very first Might and Magic game, and now it's ported to the NES. Gameplay is a classic first-person dungeon crawler. Make a party of heroes, explore towns for people to talk to and getting equipment, and go through dungeons killing all kinds of monsters. Combat plays out in a lot of texts, explaining all attacks and results. A Might and Magic staple is having tons of additional options in battle. You're able to block, 
bribe monsters to avoid fighting altogether, and protect other party members. Weirdly, this port of the original Might and Magic game would actually hit the Famicom in Japan first, back in 1990. The NES version also boasts way better visuals than the MS-DOS original. For one, there's actually some color in everything, and the animations of the walls and the dungeons really does help a lot with not feeling lost. Weirdly, this isn't the most advanced version of Might and Magic 1. That would go to the TurboGrafx CD version, which has even better graphics and voice acting and is exclusive to Japan. Also a fun little tidbit, the NES version has music, unlike the original, and the music was worked on by Masaharu Iwata, who is best known for contributing to the soundtracks of Tactics Ogre, Final Fantasy Tactics, and Final Fantasy XII. We'll be seeing plenty of other Might and Magic games throughout the 90s, as by the time the first one was ported to the NES, the PC was already on Might and Magic 4, and has many spin-offs such as Heroes of Might and Magic, Crusaders, Warriors, and Legends of Might and Magic, and also that first-person action game for Xbox 360, Dark Messiah of Might and Magic. The latest in the main series is Might and Magic 10, released in 2014. Since we're talking about game series that ends up having unexpected spin-offs, the Super Nintendo got kablooey this week in 1992. Kablooey is a weird isometric puzzler. You're on a platform of several squares covered in big red bombs. As Kablooey, you need to go around and detonate every single bomb, but do so in such a way that you don't blow yourself up accidentally, make yourself drown, and don't trap yourself somewhere where you can't reach the other bombs. It's really, really boring. Try as I might, I just can't find myself interested in games like this. And reviews at the time weren't interested either because we couldn't find any reviews of it. Kablooey for the SNES is more or less a remake. It originally came out for the Amiga and Commodore 64 in 1988 under the name Bamboozle, which these days sounds more like a name for a new Pokemon. It would eventually get a sequel in 2001 for the PlayStation 1 called The Bombing Islands. And no, your eyes are not deceiving you. That is Kid Clown, as in the same character from Kid Clown in Crazy Chase. The Japanese title of the PS1 game is The Bombing Islands Kid Clown's Crazy Puzzle. Even weirder, The Bombing Islands got redeveloped for the Nintendo 64, but was changed to Charlie Blast's Territory, which now stars a demolition worker and has a four player mode. But thanks to bizarre release scheduling, the N64 version came out two years before the PS1 version. As for Kablooey on the SNES, for some reason you can currently get it on Steam under its original name, Bamboozle. Even more weird, Kablooey is one of the games that you can play on the Nintendo Switch's online Super Nintendo catalog, but also changed back to its original name, Bamboozle. Even though no one was asking for it. Once upon a time in the sewer, there were four cute little petals. Who suddenly went through this incredible mutation process? One of the most beloved Super Nintendo games of all time needs little introduction. Released August 15th, 1992, was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4, Turtles in Time. This is Kawabungi. And this is Kawabongo. But the turtles for your 16-bit system are Kawabunga! Holy cow, it's Turtles in Time! The cool arcade game for Super NES, now with tasty turtle duels. And psych up your Sega Genesis with the Hyper Stone Heist, an all-new 3D turtle thrash. So remember, this is Kawabingo. But the turtles for Super NES and Sega Genesis are... Kawabunga, dude. Turtles in Time is a beat-em-up for Super Nintendo, featuring two-player co-op as the eponymous Ninja Turtles, battling all manner of foot soldiers and time-traveling to different eras, with each end of the level having an iconic Ninja Turtles villain to defeat. There is a bigger variety of attacks compared to usual beat-em-ups, allowing for multiple kinds of jumping attacks, running, sliding, shoulder tackling, and more. What many people surprisingly didn't know is that this is a port of the second Ninja Turtles arcade game, also called Turtles in Time. Some things had to be lost in the transition, such as some frames of animation being removed, 
less voice lines, and of course, the SNES version does not have the four-player mode. However, what the Super Nintendo version gained far outweighs the losses. There's now a time trial and versus mode added. The final boss of the prehistoric era was changed from Cement Man to Slash. The Rat King boss was added to the end of Sewer Surfing. Bebop and Rocksteady were the new bosses at the end of the Pirate Ship, and an all-new Technodrome level was added. Toka and Razor from the second Ninja Turtles movie were moved to be the bosses in that Technodrome level. The final boss was changed from Shredder with a laser sword to Super Shredder, also from the second TMNT movie. And changes were made to take advantage of the SNES's Mode 7 graphics. Neon Knight Riders is now a behind-the-back perspective, and an all-new Shredder boss was added to the end of the Technodrome level. It requires players to beat them, by throwing enemies at your television screen. And that was one of the biggest things for Turtles in Time. The months leading up to the game had a ludicrous amount of hype for a multitude of reasons. The most obvious one being, they're the Ninja Turtles. The cartoon show was still running strong. Toys were everywhere. In 1990, the first movie was released and did well. And in 1991, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 Secret of the Ooze hit theaters and did gangbusters. Also, I don't know if this is just a coincidence or not, but the next movie, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, comes out in 1993, and in that movie, they just so happen to travel in time. So, more importantly than all of that, Everyone in the industry was hyped for the Super Nintendo game. It was shown at the Consumer Electronics Show earlier in the year, and people walked away impressed. It was already being called the best-looking, best-sounding game of the entire show floor. But what stood out to everyone was the fact that you could throw enemies at the screen. These kinds of graphics just weren't seen before at home. It was typical to see this kind of thing in arcade games, like the coin-op Turtles in Time, or the super scaling technology used by Sega in their games like Afterburner or Super Hang-On. Seeing this on a console, and geniusly using the Super Nintendo's Mode 7 scaling to make it happen, was impressive and a technical marvel. And upon release, reviewers loved it. Electronic Gaming Monthly in issue 36 gave it straight 9s out of 10 across the board. Each reviewer complimented the graphics, the sound, the music, and the smoothness of the controls. This is one of the rare instances in which the console port is actually better than the arcade version. Now, despite all of this, Turtles in Time for the SNES is not a best seller. It doesn't even crack the top 50 best selling SNES games. It is frequently regarded now as one of the best Super Nintendo games of all time, let alone the best Ninja Turtles game. As the years passed, Turtles in Time would see numerous versions and re-releases. Sega fans know of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles The Hyperstone Heist, which would release a couple of months later. That's a separate Sega version of Turtles in Time, which shares a lot with the SNES version, but has its own exclusive levels and bosses but you can't throw enemies at the screen. In 2009, a full-fledged remake was created in the form of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time reshelled for the Xbox 360 Marketplace and PlayStation 3 Store. And it was bad. The 3D graphics sucked, the stages became muddied and lifeless, and the entire soundtrack sounded like crap. In 2022, the all-new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge is an original game that pays a lot of homage to Turtles in Time, including throwing enemies into the screen, and one stage beginning with Big Apple 3 p.m. And also coming at the end of this August 2022 is the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Kawabunga Collection. It contains a total of 13 different Ninja Turtles games, including the arcade version of Turtles in Time, and for the first time on a non-Nintendo platform, the SNES version of Turtles in Time. Last month, we had the home release of Street Fighter 2, and we're already starting the line of clones. Released this week in 1992 was Fighting Masters for the Sega Genesis. Fighting Masters is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game featuring 12 different alien characters duking it out for supremacy. The story is that a supernova is going to eradicate the universe, and some higher power will allow one race to survive. Whoever wins this fighting tournament. 
Gameplay is simplistic, having you jump around and attack, sometimes grappling and doing some wrestling style moves. Each character doesn't really have a bunch of special moves, but really more like one trait that makes them slightly different than the others. The main thing is that every time a character is thrown or knocked back, they'll take additional damage every time they hit a wall or bounce off the ground. Honestly, I found this frustrating every time I played it. The wall hit would cause a freeze and be really irritating as it delays me getting to have an action. Combine that with the erratic movement and the only buttons being jump and attack, it's not the greatest game in the world. Fighting Masters was developed by Almanac Corporation. A lot of the same developers of this game would later go on to work for another notable project from Almanac, a game called Evo Search for Eden on the Super Nintendo. The TurboGrafx-16 also saw a new release this week with Jackie Chan's Action Kung Fu. In it, you play as Jackie Chan himself when an evil wizard steals his girlfriend or something. It's an action platformer where you run, jump, and attack enemies to get to the end of each stage. While you do have five continues to use, you only have one life. The art style is very hit or miss. You're either into the weirdly chibi art style of Jackie Chan himself, or you're not at all. And to some of you, this game may look incredibly familiar that's because it's actually an upgraded port of Jackie Chan's Action Kung Fu from the NES, released in early 1991. Now, in the 90s, by this point, Jackie Chan was already a massive star in China, but he'd only just begun to make a name for himself in America. So it wasn't exactly a huge tie-in draw to have a movie star's name and likeness attached to a random game. New Line Cinema presents The Action Hero who does all his own stunts. Jackie Chan. Credit to the TurboGrafx-16's box art of the game, though. That's a pretty good drawing of Jackie Chan. Reviews of Action Kung Fu weren't great. It was described as passable at best, strange, and one particular reviewer hating the art style, with the bold claim of the chibi head bigger than body art phase is already long gone. Reviews used to make no sense. The developer who ported this game, Now Production, had mostly worked as an assistant studio, being brought in to help polish other titles and help wherever they were needed. But they did do some major titles of their own. They're likely most known for making the Sega Genesis games Splatterhouse 2 and Splatterhouse 3. An obscure handheld with an even more obscure game. Released this week in 1992 was Kung Food for the Atari Lynx. So you want another reason to buy an Atari Lynx? 16-bit action sports. Great sport. We got NFL football, hockey, basketball, baseball heroes. Now Lynx is just $79.99. Lynx has hot arcade hits, Toki, Steel Talents. We've even got pinball jams. Two great big pinball machines jammed into one incredible cart. Hey, for a limited time, Lynx is only $79.99. Over 4,000 colors on the largest portable video screen available. So get your shoes and run to the store. You know you want a Lynx. The most fun you can hold in your hands. Links by Atari. As I've mentioned time and time before, beat em ups were everywhere in the early 90s. Even handhelds like the Atari Lynx needed their own unique one, but how do you make one stand out? By making it food themed. Kung Fu has you playing as a scientist, shrinking himself down to defeat mutated vegetables inside of his own freezer. This means punching carrots, tomatoes, peas, and some I'm not even entirely sure on. You'll look like a super naked jolly green giant, only little. Gameplay is as straightforward as a beat em up can get. Slowly walk to the right, punch and kick everything that comes your way. I will give the game credit at least. You can duck and do crouching attacks. Along the way, there are tons of health restoring power ups and plenty of extra lives. This makes it a very simple, very easy playthrough and quick to beat. You can finish the entire game in only 30 minutes. Although I almost prefer dying on purpose because on the game over screen, the jolly green giant melts into a giant jolly skeleton. It sure is a game. GamePro was not enthused by it, with an average score of a 6.5 out of 10. They did at least say that they were impressed by the game's graphics, which honestly isn't too shabby for a development team of two guys. The ending teases a potential sequel that would never come. In a historical moment, 
This week, the Super Nintendo got its first ever first person shooter game. That's right, released this week in 1992, was Faceball 2000. Faceball 2000 is an FPS, and it made it onto the console before Wolfenstein and a year before Doom would even be made. Gameplay has you going through a simplistic maze, shooting yellow balls at your enemies, which are smiley faces. Every enemy is a different kind of smiley face, with the easiest ones having funny names like Shoot Me and I Shoot You. Once you shoot so many enemies, you can take the exit panel and move on to the next level. Although, if they are able to kill you, they taunt you by saying, Have a nice day! Have a nice day. Ooh, I hate that, you son of a bitch. On its surface, Faceball 2000 seems like a boring, rudimentary shooter with not the greatest frame rate. But this existing on the SNES at this time is a pretty big deal. This was able to obtain a proper 3D maze a full year before the existence of the FX chip, which was used to power future 3D SNES games like Star Fox and Doom. It's also a port. It was originally known as MIDI maze for the Atari ST computers in 1987. It was extra notable then because it featured the ability to link computers together using the Atari ST's MIDI port to allow for multiplayer. This was even before the concept of LAN parties. In fact, MIDI maze essentially created the concept of death matches. It was also the first to use regenerating health in a shooter, long before games like Call of Duty. However, it wasn't the first game ever to use regenerating health. That would be Highlight. The SNES version of Faceball 2000 is actually more of a port of the Game Boy version, which was released in December of 1991. On the Game Boy, it was incredibly popular. And once again, a technical marvel being able to make 3D graphics seem feasible on the little handheld. It was also notable for having link cable support for multiplayer, allowing for, and I want you to picture this, up to 16 players at a time all holding a Game Boy. The Super Nintendo version has only two players. In fact, it's easily the weakest version with its low frame rate and honestly boring gameplay. It also becomes impossibly difficult after the fifth level as enemy faces can move and shoot faster than the choppy frame rate allows you to with no continues. And the lesser multiplayer from the popular Game Boy version is a strict downgrade. Although it could have been worse, there was a planned but thankfully canceled version set for the Virtual Boy. Quick, name your favorite Capcom arcade game. Perfect, not a single person said Magic Sword, released this week for the Super Nintendo in 1992. Originally released as an arcade game in 1990, Magic Sword is a side-scrolling action fantasy game. You play as a stereotypical buff shirtless sword and shield guy, cutting down enemies to get treasure chests and collecting keys to unlock additional doors. The game's biggest mechanic is that you can find allies that will join you. They're not playable, but each will have their own abilities to enhance your attacks. You can find allies such as a knight, a ninja, a cleric, and a big man. Innovative for its time was the ability to choose your stage you want to start at, in which there are 50 of them, which all last about a minute each. Being a port of the arcade game, some cuts had to be made for the Super Nintendo version. The main thing is that the arcade version was two-player co-op. Hilariously, I want to point out the box art for the Western SNES release. There it features the Archer Lady with a gun. At no point in the game, does she get a gun? Magic Sword also had multiple endings. Upon beating the final boss, you can either choose to take the evil black orb for yourself or destroy it, allowing you to choose between a bad and a good ending. The game still isn't very good. It fakes some rudimentary RPG mechanics, which wouldn't be realized until Knights of the Round, or better yet, Dungeons and Dragons Tower of Doom. And without co-op, it's very repetitive to get through all of the levels. It didn't review very well either. Except from Nintendo Power. They featured the game in their July 1992 issue alongside Street Fighter 2 and reviewed it with an average score of a 3.5 out of 5. UK Magazine Super Play awarded it a 58%, stating, an awful game, basically. For whatever reason, in 2010, Capcom released Final Fight Double Impact, a port of Final Fight for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. And I guess the double impact part is that the only other game on that collection is Magic Sword. Get your Domino's $25 million Nintendo Instant Win Game card with a chance to win thousands of free Super NES, Game Boy systems, Super Mario Kart games, plus savings on pizza and Coke Classic. Some good games create copycat clones. 
truly great games create all new genres. Released on September 1st, 1992, was Super Mario Kart. Let's go racing! It's Super Mario Kart Funny Car Madness! Only on Super NES! Turn the track into a giant mud pit! Or burn rubber on ice, wood, or asphalt! Fly! Mix it up for the big boys! See Bowser and his big foot dropping truck! See Yoshi's go kart really good! Go. Mushrooms, banana peels, turtle shell! Dino Might! Check your rear view and make a mean test! Or go into battle mode and ruin his day! Two speed! Fast and way too fast! It's two player fun on the split screen! Only for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System! Now when you're playing with power, Super Power! Super Mario Kart was a massive departure for Mario. He's done sports, he's done art, but racing, bah, get out of here. Yet that's exactly what he did. Mario Kart uses the SNES Mode 7 graphics to its fullest by having Mario and his friends race around several Mario themed tracks. The biggest innovation that Mario Kart provided was the ability to drive over item boxes, allowing you to use a randomly selected Mario themed item to help yourself or hinder your opponents. Mushrooms that give you a speed boost, Koopa shells that make your opponent spin out, invincibility stars, and perhaps oddly the most iconic, the banana peel. But also, lightning bolts, yes, blue shells, no, didn't exist yet. It also features several playable characters from the Mario universe, which shouldn't be overlooked. For only the second time since Super Mario Bros. 2, Peach and Toad are playable. This is the first time you can play as Bowser in any game. And this reintroduces Donkey Kong Jr., who has been absent in the West since 1986. Development began when Nintendo was satisfied with how F-Zero turned out, but wanted to take it one step further two-player simultaneous racing. It was designed from day one to have some kind of two-player split-screen mode. In fact, this is likely why that even in single-player, you're still only using half the screen. The other half is a map, of course, or with the push of a button, a rear view mirror lets you see who's behind you, which on a technical level, this was incredibly impressive at the time as was the actual two-player racing mode. It's also notable for having tough computer opponents. For one, they all have their own special items that they can use, and most of them, you can't. As a kid, I would hit Peach's mushrooms on purpose because I thought shrinking down small was really funny. Also notable, the computer opponents were so difficult because they straight up cheat. The rubber banding AI is apparent. This allows them to suddenly catch up to you even when they were way behind. This also means that they have infinite items and don't need to race over item blocks themselves. And secretly off screen, they'll drive straight through items and obstacles to keep them in the race. This game is way harder than any of us remember it being. Of course, what made Mario Kart such a staple for so many people who had an SNES was the multiplayer mode. Racing together in the different Grand Prix was both competitive and cooperative. You wanted to work together to stop the computers from winning so you could move on to the next race, but you didn't want to let your little brother or friend beat you because that would be shameful. And once those frustrations grew to a head, you took it out into the amazing battle mode. This changed racing games as we knew it. Now there was a way to face off against a friend, but your objective was not to reach the finish line the fastest, it was kill them. Ride around four large open room battle arenas, grab those items, and hit the other player three times to win. This battle mode was incredible. This kept our attention and got more playtime than the actual race modes ever did. Super Mario Kart was loved from day one. It reviewed incredibly well from all magazine outlets. Nintendo Power issue 41 was dedicated solely to it and reviewed it with an average score of a 4.3 out of 5, which is surprisingly restrained for Nintendo Power. As to its legacy, just take a look around. Its first sequel, Mario Kart 64, skyrocketed the franchise as a pillar to any new hardware Nintendo would release. Every major Nintendo platform would get its own Mario Kart to this day, with the Nintendo Switch getting Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Originally a complete port of the Wii U game, but already starting this year, it is actively getting new courses thanks to new DLC. Super Mario Kart was so successful, it created the racing subgenre of the kart racer. Many other companies tried their hand at mascot racing, often in go-karts and getting some kind of weaponry through item boxes. Sonic Drift, Crash Nitro Kart, Atari Kart, Konami Crazy Racers, Star Wars Super Bombad Racing. Mario Kart sold millions. It became a player's choice game, sold well over 8 million copies, and in the top selling Super Nintendo games of all time, it ranks 
at number four. Also released this week in 1992, is Axelay for the Super Nintendo. Axelay was developed by Konami and is another kick-ass shoot-em-up. It's both a side-scrolling shooter and a vertical shooter, using the Mode 7 graphics to do some visually neat things to make it seem like you're flying to the horizon. There's also some impressively awesome bosses to fight that look just spectacular. Rather than collecting power-ups, your ship has three different weapons that you can swap between. Get shot, however, and the selected weapon gets destroyed. This means you can take three shots before you die, or if you fly into something, you instantly blow up. There's a little strategy there in what weapon you want to use and what you would be fine with losing. This was also Konami in the SNES era, which means the music in the game is just fantastic. Axel was developed at Konami by a small group of developers who would eventually leave the company. Those developers would make their own studio called Treasure and would go on to make titles such as Gunstar Heroes, Mischief Makers, and Ikaruga. Seriously, I feel like Axel is one of those really good SNES games that gets constantly overlooked by more well-known titles. It should really be up there right alongside Gradius 3 and Arrow Fighters. It's that good. Thankfully, reviewers at the time noticed as well. GamePro Magazine rated it with an average score of a 4.75 out of 5. They especially loved the graphics and sound quality, and the fact that there's basically no slowdown in the entire game. And for something completely different, released this week in 1992, was Spy vs. Spy for the Nintendo Game Boy. Spy vs. Spy is a comic series featured in Mad Magazine beginning in issue number 60 in 1961 and is still going today. It was about two spies, one dressed in white and the other dressed in black, getting into cartoon-like violent shenanigans, leaving booby traps for each other in a comedic fashion. Evidently, they were popular enough to get their own video games. The Game Boy version is a puzzle versus game of sorts. Playing as either spy, you run around searching item boxes to acquire traps and placing them throughout each level. Should the other spy search where a trap is placed, they'll take damage. Or if that isn't your style, you can also run up and just punch the crap out of them. The goal is to find the special briefcase of secret documents and then escape the level before the other spy can. Dying isn't game over, as rather it delays you for a very long time, giving the other spy a huge time advantage. It is an exercise in frustration. It really isn't the most fun game in the world, mostly because your own traps can damage you. And I sure am not remembering where I put all those things. Also, every time you place a trap, you have to wait as the spy does their signature snickering laughter animation. If you've played Spy vs. Spy on the NES, it's very similar, only this game has them on an island. I still don't like it. Reviews of the game weren't great either. Nintendo Power themselves basically said the idea was cool, but execution lacking, and got a score of a 3.1 out of 5. At least if you don't feel like suffering alone, it did have two-player link cable support. Barbie Beach Buggy. Another day, another movie game adaptation. Released this week in 1992 was Dino City for the SNES. Dino City is a straightforward platformer. Ride your dinosaur to the end of each stage, avoiding obstacles, attacking enemies to defeat them, or just jump on their head. At the start, you can choose between the boy and his dino, or the girl and her dino, with the only difference being that one has a melee attack and the other has a ranged arrow. Navigate through plenty of prehistoric themed stages, do some bonus levels, and defeat bosses. Dino City is not just another themed platformer. Among the dozens you can already find on the SNES, it is based on the 1991 movie Adventures in Dinosaur City. Dinosaurs, starring Boy the Bara Pterodactyl. What with all the rockets? Cops, the total Triceratops. Rex, the rad Tyrannosaurus. And the wacky Rockies. See Adventures in Dinosaur City. Gimme Claw. Destined to be the biggest hit in 50 million reptilian years. In the movie, three kids get sucked into a portal and end up in a land of dinosaurs who are very hip, rad, and cool, whom they immediately befriend and help stop some evil cavemen or whatever. I don't know, I refuse to watch the whole thing. That serves as the basis for the game, though only two of the kids would end up being playable. Amazingly, the game isn't terrible. Controls are fine, if a bit slippery. The stages are varied enough, if a bit simplistic. And there's some cool puzzle 
solving elements. At any time, you can hop off your dinosaur to run around on foot, allowing you to get unreachable items or clear a path for your dino buddy to fit through. The only real frustrating thing is, why does it take so many hits just to kill a guy? Dino City was developed by Irem Software, who is likely most well known for developing the game series R-Type. In the beginning of 1993, Irem began running a promotion for Dino City. Purchase two of their games, cut out the UPC codes on them, and mail them in, and you'll get a dinosaur t-shirt. So mathematically, you buy two video games at about $60 each in 1992 money, and you get a t-shirt. And you also ruin two perfectly good SNES boxes. Get this fabulous inflatable dinosaur free when you buy two copies of Adventures in Dinosaur City. Over two and a half feet tall and ready to turn your store into Dinosaur City. Don't forget, these dinosaurs become extinct if not ordered by July 29, 1992. So order your two copies of Adventures in Dinosaur City now from Republic Pictures Home Video. Upon release, Dino City reviewed better than you'd think. It got favorable reviews from both Nintendo Power and Electronic Gaming Monthly, liking its bright, colorful graphics, and found it fine to play, even if it was meant for a younger demographic. As for the company that made the original movie, they went out of business long ago. And now, you can watch the whole movie for free right here on YouTube. Hudson Soft was still supporting their co-developed hardware the best they could. One of the games from them this week, was Soldier Blade for the TurboGrafx-16. Soldier Blade is yet another space-themed shoot-em-up, scrolling vertically and blasting away everything on the screen that isn't you. Get your first power-up and a little helper ship starts following you around. Collect and store up to three power-ups and end up with some devastating weaponry to take out waves of enemies and bosses. Some of the coolest gameplay innovations it had was that at any point, you could sacrifice one of your stored power-ups to do a screen-clearing bomb attack. And that helper ship that follows you around can absorb a hit for you. You can also send it out to do its own attack after storing enough energy. Also, it's not really a gameplay innovation, but I personally love the voice that says, alert, alert, when a boss appears. And the same crunchy voice that says, I'll be back when you beat them. Soldier Blade was developed and published by Hudson Soft. They originally wanted to title it Sonic Blaster F92, but wouldn't you know it, that name was already trademarked, but at least for the box art, they got it made by Yuji Kaida, who is best known for producing art for the anime series Macross, Ultraman, and Godzilla. Reviewers were not impressed by it. Electronic Gaming Monthly didn't score it higher than a 7, with one particular reviewer criticizing it for being a space shooter with a lackluster story. A lackluster story for a shoot 'em up Reviews used to make no sense. And either way, they were wrong. This is an awesome shooter for the TurboGrafx-16, with some butter smooth animations, screen filling graphics, and some seriously kick ass music. Give it a shot sometime, which you still could, as it was released on the Wii U's virtual console service in 2014. Also coming from Hudson Soft this week, and also for the TurboGrafx-16, was New Adventure Island. New Adventure Island continues to follow the exploits of Master Higgins, whose new wife gets immediately kidnapped for whatever reason, and he's pissed about it. Gameplay continues to be familiar to previous Adventure Island games. Run forward and use projectiles to take out enemies while collecting food to keep your stamina meter up so that you don't get exhausted and die. Use one of four different weapons and sometimes ride a skateboard like a really cool dude but still wearing proper safety equipment. The Adventure Island series originated on the NES, which had Adventure Island 1, 2, and 3. The SNES had Super Adventure Island 1 and 2. New Adventure Island came out on the TurboGrafx-16 after Super Adventure Island on the SNES, but before Adventure Island 3 on the NES. So it's like Adventure Island 2.75 or whatever? Reviews of the game were positive, but all noted that it isn't really doing anything crazy new that you gotta see. Which, they're right, it's just another Adventure Island game on a different platform. New Adventure Island would get ported many years later, as it was made available for the Virtual Console for the Nintendo Wii in 2007 and for the Wii U in 2014. Hudson Soft was acquired by Konami in 2005, which is like willingly choosing to move into a burning building. So we are unlikely to see any other new Adventure Island anything anytime soon.
This may sound shocking, but the Neo Geo got a fighting game released on it. I know, I know. Released September 11th, 1992 for the Neo Geo AES was World Heroes. World Heroes is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game that's more or less a clone of Street Fighter 2 to compete with Street Fighter 2. There are selectable fighters hailing from all over the world, each with their own strengths, weaknesses, and of course, special moves. There are three buttons to use, punch, kick, and throw. You can use either weak or strong punches and kicks, which is determined by how long you hold that button. Gameplay-wise, it's a Street Fighter clone through and through. However, look at the actual character roster. Many of them are based on real, notable people. For example, Dragon's the clear Bruce Lee phenotype. The sorcerer Rasputin is very clearly Rasputin. Jean d'Arc is, well, Joan of Arc. American wrestler Muscle Power is absolutely just Hulk Hogan. And Brocken is... Well, Brocken is a cyborg Nazi. That's not entirely a joke, by the way. During the production of the game, developer ADK, or Alpha at the time, had an entirely wacky fighter lineup planned of more famous historical figures, including Al Capone, Jack the Ripper, Billy the Kid, and cyborg Nazi Brocken was originally cyborg Nazi Adolf Hitler but I guess Wolfenstein 3D already beat them to that by a few months. Also unique to the game is the deathmatch mode. No actual death is involved, but instead stage hazards are activated. The walls become electrified or just on fire. There are oil slicks, spiked walls, basically no hiding in the corner allowed. In more comparisons to Street Fighter 2, it also has bonus stages in the form of carving stone into a buff dude statue and breaking falling pots. And in a twist, the final boss, Gigas, Gigas? Gigas could morph into any of the other fighters, months before another fighting game's notable final boss could do that. World Heroes was originally released in the arcade on July 28, 1992. When the home AES version was released in September, World Heroes was doing super well. It was charting above Street Fighter 2 and was popular enough that a sequel was quickly greenlit and released in less than a year. Despite the surprising popularity of the time, the World Heroes series didn't continue much after its second game. However, some of the characters do make cameo appearances in other SNK games. Surprisingly, none of them show up at all in the SNK vs. Capcom games, but Jean d'Arc is a DLC assist character in SNK Heroines Tag Team Frenzy. Remember like a month ago when we were talking about the Clue video game and brought up Monopoly? Well, out this week in 1992 is Monopoly for the SNES and Sega Genesis. How did I make it big? I know how <laughs> to play the game. I buy real estate, hotels, fancy cars, even railroads. And I take chances to make it big. Uh-oh, you've got to play the game. I Monopoly game. What can I really say here? It's Monopoly. Roll the dice around, move your piece with little animations, and after about 25 minutes, ask yourself why anyone bothers to play Monopoly because it's never actually fun. It does that hand animation thing for rolling dice that they had already used in the Clue board game, so that's nice. Also like Clue, there's no music. It's an eerily silent, lonely thing to play even with friends. The exception being that when you do an auction for a property, then rather loud, irritating piano music blares out. Many people who play Monopoly found some shocking revelations when playing the video game because the video game plays Monopoly correctly. It is incredibly accurate to the rules as written and there's no extra stuff on top of it. This meant that as kids, for the first time, we had to learn to play without all the bizarre house rules that spread around the playground like the Lara Croft nude code secret. There's no money kept at free parking, you still get rent while you're in jail, and any property not immediately purchased must be auctioned off. It still isn't fun. A video game version that did the math for us still didn't make Monopoly any more fun to play. I hated that as a kid. I rented this game multiple times. I can't believe I went from having Monopoly on my Nintendo to having Nintendo on my Monopoly. Collector's edition, my ass. Monopoly for the NES, SNES, Sega Genesis, and the Game Boy were all developed by Sculptured Software, which is a rather mundane project for any developer. However, they eventually did all right for themselves. They were the ones responsible for the home ports of Mortal Kombat 1, 2, and 3. Now, in the 90s, people were willing to make a platformer of anything they could. Case in point, released this week in 1992 for the Sega Genesis, is Green Dog, the Beached Surfer Dude. You can eat them, or they can eat you. Uh. 
Green Dog is a platformer about a surfer dude trying to like totally undo this bummer curse on his amulet, man. I'd argue that the real curse is him not being able to see out from underneath his own hair. Or his hat, I, I can't really tell. As you walk forward, every living thing does its best to murder Green Dog. And you can fight back with frisbee attacks, eat junk food to restore health, and in a surprising twist, no surfing. You do skateboard though. Also, there's a song in the game that just totally rips off under the sea from The Little Mermaid. Who is Green Dog? Where did Green Dog come from? He was the creation of entrepreneuring businessman Rick Green. Do you remember those foam footballs in the early 90s that were covered in Velcro so that you could easily catch them with Velcro gloves? He invented those. He used the money from that patent to create a board game, Surf Up, featuring the character of Green Dog. The video game would be based loosely on that. The box art for the video game was done by Cam DeLeon, who is best known as the artist for three separate albums for Tool. I hate this game. It's infuriating, unfair, and nothing about the surfer theme lines up well or pays off whatsoever, and Green Dog looks dumb. As for reviews at the time, well, UGM sister magazine Megaplay gave it a high score of an 8, but also another reviewer gave it a 4, whereas GamePro magazine gave it an almost perfect score. There's no way! Of every game we've discussed on this show this year, this is the highest score we have seen from GamePro. How much of that Velcro football money did Mr. Dog pay them? How much? Reviews used to make no sense at the time. Nintendo Systems got boxing games that weren't just Punch-Out. Released this week in 1992 was George Foreman's KO Boxing for the SNES. George Foreman's KO Boxing is, well, it's a boxing game for the Super Nintendo. You play as George Foreman and punch your way through a gauntlet of opponents. Some of these opponents could be real people as well, but I couldn't tell you, I know very little about boxing. You can make George dodge left and right and barrage your opponent with a flurry of face and body punches until they get knocked out. Every time they get back up, their profile picture shows them a little bit more beat up. Somewhat hilariously, at the start of every round is the bikini clad woman, carrying the round number who walks across very, very slowly. And instead of a voice sample of the actually copyrighted Let's Get Ready to Rumble, a voice sometimes says, It's party time. It's party time. Actually, the voices are some of the funniest things in the game. Every now and then, you get voice samples of George Foreman himself saying things like, How am I doing? And, This guy can't hurt me. You're mine, old man. Also, between each round, you will be reminded that this game is brought to you by Doritos. Take that, Call of Duty. Clearly, the gameplay is very similar, if not directly inspired by Nintendo's Punch-Out. But it goes a step farther than that. George Foreman's KO Boxing was developed by Beam Software, and this game uses the same engine of their previous boxing game, Power Punch 2, on the NES. Infamously, Power Punch 2 was originally a direct sequel to Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, starring Mike Tyson until they removed him due to his ongoing legal issues. It gets weirder. George Foreman's KO Boxing was originally on the Sega Genesis, then ported to the SNES, but there would also be versions for the Sega Game Gear and the Sega Master System. However, those versions would actually be based on a different boxing game, James Buster Douglas Knockout Boxing from the Master System. Buster Douglas is the first man to famously knock out Mike Tyson. Upon release, George Foreman's KO Boxing received middling reviews despite his star power. Many didn't like the controls, graphics, or the unfair difficulty. It would get a sequel though, titled Foreman For Real, which, as a treat, we'll show it to you. Because it's horrifying. Also released this week in 1992 was Word Zap for the Nintendo Game Boy. Word Zap is a puzzle game where you're given a pool of letters and you need to put together as many words as you can from those letters. Oh, Bartle, 
it's, it's just bottle. It does feature two player connectivity through the Game Boy Link cable and two copies of the game. But in that, when someone makes a word that another player has already found, that word gets zapped and removed from both players' racks. Upon release, Game Pro and Nintendo Power both praised it with positive reviews, but who cares about that? This is what you need to see. Word Zap is actually a port on the Game Boy, as it was originally released for Windows in 1991. That's, at best, Windows 3.0. It was on the Microsoft Entertainment Pack Volume 3. However, 30 years later, you can still visit its official website. Fire up your favorite internet browser and go to wordzap.com, and there it is in all of its 90s glory. The Game Boy got another release this week in 1992 with The Simpsons, Bart vs. the Juggernauts. Bart vs. the Juggernauts is basically another minigame collection, similar to other Simpsons games. The story is a parody of American Gladiators and has Bart taking on various challenges, which are mostly platformers, more or less. One of them is like a basketball game where you have to avoid Juggernauts and pitfalls. Another has you skateboarding down some huge ramps where you try to drop kick a Juggernaut. And a sort of sumo wrestling one here where you drop kick a lady Juggernaut out of the ring. There's more than that but you can imagine how fun they are not. Interestingly, between each round, there's commentary by longtime Simpsons characters, Kent Brockman and Dr. Marvin Monroe. The second guy is a rarity, as the character only appeared in the first season of The Simpsons. You may remember him from that one shock therapy episode. He was retired and then killed off screen in the series because Simpsons creator Matt Groening and his voice actor Harry Shearer didn't like him. So his appearance in the video game is a bit of an anomaly. Anyway, the game's dumb, but because they need to make some sales, Nintendo Power reviewed it favorably, and they're now playing section. Figure, sofa, and boob tube sold separately, only from Mattel. I the start of a beloved series of games was 30 years ago. Released this week in 1992 was Soul Blazer, for the Super Nintendo. Originally titled Soul Blader, Soul Blazer is a top-down action RPG which naturally garnered lots of comparisons to The Legend of Zelda Link to the Past. However, Soul Blazer has stronger RPG elements. Go into dungeons to slash down monsters, level up, and collect items. As you defeat monsters, you free the souls of people, making more and more NPCs reappear in the city, making the sense of progression be not just your character, but also the world around you. Only a year after the Super Nintendo's release in North America, it was dubbed that 1992 was the year of the SNES RPG, and Soul Blazer was one of the best examples of that. But leading up to its release, Soul Blazer got almost no press coverage or previews. It didn't even get a television commercial. The most it ever got before its release was a single page magazine advert pointing out that it's an action RPG from the same publisher as Act Razor. The few published reviews for Soul Blazer were generally quite favorable. Nintendo Power graded it on an average of a 3.5 out of 5 rounded up, or roughly the equivalent of a 7 out of 10, calling it a hero quest type of game. Electronic Gaming Monthly was even more positive with an average score of an 8.25 out of 10 from four reviewers, each one praising its graphics, sound, and combination of adventure and role-playing gameplay. Were they right about it today? Yes, definitely! Soul Blazer is a fantastic game on the SNES and holds up on its own. Despite it being a clearly early Super Nintendo game, it plays fantastically well, and the way it's structured out makes it surprisingly addicting. Clearing out monsters and seeing the next town provides consistent intrigue as you want to see the next area. Soul Blazer became the first entry in what has become known as the Quintet Trilogy. Developer Quintet made three games on the Super Nintendo, all with similar themes and gameplay, but are not direct sequels, with each one improving vastly over the previous. The sequel and second part of the Quintet Trilogy released two years later and was called Illusion of Gaia. This all led into the third and final entry, which was released in Japan and Europe, but was never released in North America and was called Terranigma. Soul Blazer has never been re-released or ported to any other console. Even though it would be a great addition to something like the Nintendo Switch SNES library, it currently only exists in cartridge form. Soul Blazer went on to be largely ignored. It's estimated to have sold roughly 70,000 copies in North America. Its successors would go on to sell hundreds of thousands of copies each, making Soul Blazer the forgotten oldest child of the Quintet Trilogy. Speaking of forgotten stepchildren, also released this week was Contra Force for the NES 
in 1992. Contra is one of the most definitive games of the original Nintendo. It's the quintessential two-player co-op game and basically made the Konami code common household knowledge. Its sequel, Super C, is just as good. Contra 3 on the SNES released at the beginning of 1992 and kicks all kinds of ass. Contra Force does not. Contra Force continues the familiar run and gun gameplay only with a very different graphical style and plays much slower comparatively. And by that I mean it plays even slower and there's even worse slowdown when there's too much on the screen. The biggest standout feature is that there is no Bill or Lance of the previous Contra games, but instead four all new characters that you can swap between like it's the original Ninja Turtles on NES. They each have their own weapons, making them have their uses, and you can set another member to be a second player or a computer-controlled assistant. There's even a few top-down action sections and platforming that you have to do. It has some good ideas, but plays very poorly compared to what we all know. You don't even pick up familiar power-ups like the spreader or flame shot. It's not good, and I can't recommend it. Turns out, Neither can Konami. It's largely considered to be non-canon to whatever you want to call the Contra story these days, and at no point does Contra Force reappear in any kind of compilation, collection, or anniversary mention of any new Contra release. And there's a reason for that, and it's because it's not actually a Contra game. The original game was called Arcount and was set for release in Japan in 1991, but was canceled. Konami decided might as well make some money off of it and rebranded it as Contra Force for the dumb Americans. It was set to be the third Contra game, which is why in previews for the SNES Contra game, it was tentatively titled Super Contra 4. Then they realized the game sucks and took away its sequel number. Reviewers at the time were a bit divided. Nintendo Power praised the game, but like, of course they did. GamePro, on the other hand, declared that it was simply too slow, stating, quote, if you're thinking this cart delivers the same fast-paced Contra cool action as the previous games in the series, think again. Contra Force has never seen any kind of re-release onto any other platform. Although, in 2009's Contra Rebirth, the WiiWare game, they did remix the Contra Force character select music. In non-Nintendo games released this week, the Sega Game Gear got a port of Chuck Rock. Chuck Rock is a platformer where you play as a thick-headed caveman and Chuck Rocks. You can also belly bump enemies and eat all varieties of meat throughout the levels. The Game Gear version is notably downgraded from the Genesis and Super Nintendo versions. Namely, there's no background, just a black empty void throughout the whole game. They also had to remove any and all music. Despite this, Electronic Gaming Magazine's sister magazine, Mega Play, loved it. They reviewed it with a universal score of 8, noting how smooth it translated to the battery-consuming handheld. Surprisingly, Chuck Rock is something of a franchise. There's the original, and then there was a sequel with Chuck Rock 2, Son of Chuck, for Amiga computers, Sega Genesis, Sega CD, Sega Game Gear, and Sega Master System. And then one more sequel of sorts with BC Racers, a prehistoric kart racer on the Sega CD starring Chuck Rock and Junior. All three games were developed by Core, and Chuck was a sort of mascot for the company for many years. That is until they created an all new character whose franchise ended up being slightly more popular. And her name is Lara Croft. <laughs> 